And I'm curious before we start, uh, if you are a teacher or you work at a school, I know we've got people working at all different kinds of uh, jobs in school districts and all different kinds of school districts, would you please stand for a moment? Go ahead. If you teach anywhere, if you work in the kitchen anywhere, if you are a custodian, if you coach, whatever you do, anybody substitutes, if you're substituting, we really want to pray for you. Uh, first, I think we owe them a hand. And then why don't we go ahead and pray for them before they start their year, and then we'll get into our lesson. Father, we are very grateful for people that love our kids, that pour knowledge and wisdom and life experience into their day. And Father, we pray that you'd be with these men and women. Bless them, Lord, with wisdom, with energy and endurance. We pray, Father, that you also help them with uh, patience and the fruit of the Spirit as they deal with parents and the, their fellow adults and all the challenges that come there, too. We just pray that you give them a very, very blessed school year. We pray, Father, for the kids that will be in school, and we pray that you bless them with uh, a year's worth of joy and learning and friendship and a place of peace as they go to school. We pray for their safety, Lord, and those who protect them. We just pray that this is an outstanding year for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Matthew 13, we're going through the parables of Jesus. If you haven't been with us, parables are just stories where he tells a spiritual lesson through someone that was around them. A lot of times he's just grabbing things, most of the time, things they could see in the moment. And that's why uh, you see Jesus as he's teaching out in these small towns and villages, sometimes by the lake. It's why you will see him pull things from what's around him about crops and seeds and plants. Other times it's fish and nets and things like that. We're going to see some of those here. These were the things they could, while he was telling the story, they could look around and see this stuff. That's why we were talking about this the other day. It's why there's such a big difference between what you, the way you see Jesus teach very rural and the way you see Paul teach very urban and metropolitan. It's because they taught based on where they were. It's probably why in some settings people relate more to Paul's illustrations than to Jesus's and others vice versa because they're grabbing what they saw around them all the time. And that helps us to understand why they were using the examples and it helps us. If it's something we're not familiar with, we know that maybe in order to, for example, the parable of the fig tree that was in our Mark study this last Wednesday online. Uh, it helps us to know and maybe do a little quick research on fig trees if we want to understand that parable. Because if you've never had a fig tree, let me tell you, that one, actually that wasn't a parable, that was like a, a parable in action in a way. Uh, but to understand why Jesus did what he did when he curses the fig tree, you kind of have to know something about fig trees. And probably not that many of us do. Very few of us have fig trees and, and are fig tree tenderers like the prophets, so we just have to do a little bit of research, okay? So sometimes that's what you have to do to understand the parables, and it's not really because it's so important that you learn about fig trees. It's just context. You want to know why why did this connect with them the way that it did, and then you, you learn something about that. Today we're looking at three really short parables. Last week we looked at two really short. These are, are really short as well. One of them is just one verse. One is two verses. Really, really quick hit parables. So let's start uh, with, I, I think it makes sense to start with the first one. Does that make sense to you? Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. There's something I wanted to remind you about. We are using again the Version Bible app. So if you'd like to follow along with that, with some notes and things like that, that is available on the app. You go to the local events and the Early Church of Christ, and that's in there. I kind of forget to tell you that, but since we're restarting, I probably need to remind you. And if you have the app, the first thing you will see, I almost skipped. One of my favorite stories about uh, finding something that you don't realize is worth anything is a story of a lady named Terry Horton. Terry was uh, out shopping. She was doing a little bit of decorating in her mobile home, and she was out shopping at a garage sale for some things for the house. Her friend was with her, and she buys this painting, which she really kind of thought was kind of ugly, but it was five dollars. Any of you do ever do that at a garage sale? D, you've probably done that. It's kind of ugly, but it is only five bucks, right? And so she bought this 
And I, hey, I am not appreciative of this particular kind of art myself. So I would agree with Terry Wharton that it looked like junk when she bought it, and I wouldn't have offered two dollars. Okay, so I would have been worse. I would have been worse. I would have walked on. But. There was this painting, and it just looks like a bunch of splotches of paint. Kind of, she described it, it looking like it was a bunch of pieces of old gum on a canvas. But she thought, why not? You know, it's cheaper than buying packs of gum, five dollars anymore, isn't it? And so, you, uh, that's what she did. She buys it, she gets it home. Her friend, back at Trader Park, her friend recognizes the work of the artist. And she says, do you know what you've got? And she's she cusses a little and, and says, no, it's kind of junky to me. She said, that's a Jackson Pollock. I don't know if you know who Jackson Pollock is or not, but that's a Jackson Pollock. And he's kind of an abstract guy, but just a lot of times it is just throwing paint at a canvas and expressing himself that way. And apparently himself was messy inside. And so, so were his canvases. Uh, but this, this painting, it literally does just look like colorful gum splotted on a thing. Five dollars. Five dollars. She says, that's a Jackson Pollock. And Terry looks at her friend and goes, who the <laughs> is Jackson Pollock? That's not preacher approved. I can't quote her very closely. And she tells her about who this artist is, and they decide to go and have the painting appraised. Now, again, I'm not that appreciative. Painting feels like the wrong word for this. But to go and have it uh, appraised. In 2018, and that was back in like 2006 or 8 or something like that. In 2018, she had it appraised again and put up for auction. The appraisal in 2018 was $50 million. Oh, wow. Never throw away something from the garage that looks like old gum. It really just might be old gum, but who knows who wants it? You just don't know. $50 million. She just didn't have a clue at first what she had. And clearly, the person who owned, who owned it at the garage sale did not have a clue, which also makes us all wonder when we've had garage sales, have I done that? <laughs> Possibly. You never know. We've all seen Antiques Roadshow, right? You may have done it. So you just never know what you've got sometimes. And sometimes you do. When she had it appraised the second time, she knew what she had. Fifty million dollars. I mean, that's that's not just change. I mean, it's not the local mega, mega millions from last week, but it's pretty good. It would do, right? It would do. So now, with that in our minds, Jesus' parables are really similar to what happens to Terry Horton. Really similar. So the first one is the parable of the buried treasure. Let's read this together. It won't be on the screen. You'll have to use your Bible. Uh, in Matthew 13, starting in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. That's it. That's the whole parable. He's out, presumably working. Okay, We don't know the circumstance. Jesus doesn't give us that much detail. Uh, but we're just going to assume for the sake of things that he was legal to be there, right? And so maybe he's out working. Maybe he's putting the guy in a septic tank, you know, and, and he finds a treasure, which you usually don't do digging a septic tank. Now he finds his treasure buried out there in this field and he knows what he's got. And when he finds it, he gets excited, very excited. He goes and it says that he sells everything that he's got. Everything. What would it take for you to sell everything you have? Everything. How many of you, I'm curious, show of hands, how many of you are really sentimental and find it hard to part with things? You got a garage full of things. You got an attic full of things, shed full of things, all of those things, right? That, well, I might need that someday. And you've tried to downsize, and what happens? Somehow it always just, the, the fish grows to the size of the aquarium, right? Somehow it always ends up back full again. You move to a bigger house, and what happens? Well, how did I ever fit this in that smaller house? Because somehow it's still multiplying. Like rabbits, it just grows and grows. You can't get rid of anything. What would it take for you to get rid of everything? TV, car. What would it take for you to give up your car? Oh. Like forever. That'd be tough, right? That's a hard thing to give up. 
this man goes and sells everything. Now, why would he do that? Well, if you were at a garage sale and you found a $5 Jackson Pollock and you didn't have $5, but you had, I don't know, I've got a watch that is sentimental to me. It was uh, given to me on my 21st birthday from my mom. It would take an awful lot to sell that watch. If you knew you had a $50 million painting available to you for five, would you sell your watch? Would you work a trade? He did. He said, I don't care what I've got at home. This is worth far more. And the, the parable is that simple. What did he say it was about? What is worth giving up everything that you have in the world? He said, the kingdom of heaven is like. He's telling us what's worth that. You know, we give up a lot of things for far less. Sometimes people get to the end of their life and they find out they've given up everything for things that are just worth dust in the end or worse. They find out they give up their children. My landlord, when I was a, an AIM student in New York, back in uh, 91 and two, really nice guy. But he was telling us as young men, he said, you know, uh, there were four of us that lived in this apartment. We were all working in missions. He said, you know, you guys are really nice and you're a lot nicer to me than my kids are. And he started talking to us. He's sitting in his Mercedes outside his rent, rent houses, talking to us in the parking lot about how he would gladly have given all of that up to have connected with his kids more when they were growing up, but it was too late. We give up things of incredible value for things of eternally no value all the time. One of the things Jesus wants us to understand is in the kingdom of heaven, we get our priorities straight. We know the worth of what we've got and we gladly give up anything that gets in the way of the kingdom of heaven in our life, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, and our service to the kingdom. So we get our priorities straight. We know what it's really worth. This guy did. He gave it all up. Then there's another phrase right before that that I think we have to pay attention to. It's how he gave it up. In his joy, he gave everything he had, sold it all in his joy. There's a contrast between this man that I think we ought to catch. There was a man who was not in a parable but a real life flesh man who came to Jesus and asked him a question about the greatest commands and how do I, how do I get into the, the kingdom of heaven? How do, how do I have eternal life? He wanted what this man found in the field. And Jesus tells him, you know the commandments. What are they? And he, he recites to him the commandments and he says, but I've done all that. He says, okay, well, you still have one more thing. I want you to go and I want you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. You probably know the end of the story. The man did not sell a thing. It says that because he had so many possessions, he went away sad. He did not follow Jesus. He did not obtain what he saw because he didn't understand its value. He thought he understood the world's about more. He couldn't give it up. This parable, I think, is meant for us to see the contrast between these two men. One who knows what he's getting in the kingdom of heaven versus the one who only thinks he knows and gives it up. With joy, this man gives up everything. He goes, he buys the field. By the way, a little side lesson that I don't think is Jesus' point, but pretty important. Notice the guy deals with this all in an honest way. He goes, he pays the man fair market value for the field. He doesn't try to swindle anybody. He doesn't dig the treasure up and steal it. He goes and rightfully gains ownership to it under their system. I think that's a side thing, but you know, the kingdom of heaven is like that, isn't it? Important to remember. Anyway, he goes in joy and he gains what he wanted to gain. Then he tells us another parable, verse 45. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this guy knows pearls. He's a merchant. He's not a diver. It's important for us to get that in the context here. He's a merchant. He's not finding this in the water. He's finding this in the marketplace, which means somebody else already owns it. They've already got it. They've already found it. They know what they have. And this man, who is a merchant, has to sell everything he's got because it's that beautiful. Because he wants it that badly. He knows that it is worth more than everything he's ever obtained in his life. And it's worth it. Jesus says, this for you is the kingdom of heaven. That everything you've ever had in life, everything you've ever chased after, may be of great value. He doesn't say it's worthless, but it is worth the trade to obtain what God has for you instead. It's worth it. This man knew what he was finding, and he knew that he had to have it. Is that the way you see the kingdom of God? Is that the way you see your relationship with God? If I don't have anything else, if everything else went to pot, I have Jesus. This is what he says the kingdom of heaven is like. You know the value, and you're willing to go after at any cost the value of the kingdom of heaven. It was his pearl, as they say, of great price. He knew what it was worth, and he knew it was worth more than anything else. How many things, I'm going to hit back on this one more time, how many things that we actually know in our heads are not worth more than the kingdom? Have come first in our life before the kingdom, time after time after time. And one of the messages Jesus is getting across to us is this. You can't keep doing that because the only way you attain the kingdom of heaven is to lay all that other down, to know that it's not worth more and to make decisions that way. So it's not theory. It's not, I go on, keep living the way I've always lived, but I, I feel, I just feel that the kingdom of God is worth so much. No, he's saying it has to be borne out in your decisions. You start giving things up for the kingdom of God. You start making your choices and making your decisions and making your calendar and making your expenses and making all those things differently in light of what things are worth. We have a big pile of things back there right now. We've got, uh, it's not toilet paper. We're not toilet paper hoarders. Those, that's paper towels. <laughs> but we got paper towels and backpacks and school supplies and all kinds of stuff back there because people have gone to the store and they could have bought other things that are worth just as much, but they believed that blessing other people, living like they're a part of the kingdom of heaven, is worth more than keeping that in their pocket or buying some other thing. That's what they've decided. It's worth more than a zero candy bar. Those of you who don't know, I feel sorry for you. Those things are worth a lot. <laughs> but the kingdom of God is worth more. Blessing somebody else is worth more. And so you just make a choice. Okay, I got two bucks. I can do two bucks worth of, uh, I almost said toilet paper, two bucks worth of paper towels or two bucks worth of a zero bar. I'm not saying you feel guilty about what you do in the store. But what I'm saying is, it has to start seeping into all of our decisions and all of our choices. What is really worthwhile that I spend my life, my time, my money, my energy, my everything on? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is that one thing that's worth everything. Every time you come to that intersection of choice, it's worth it. That's what he wants us to see. And that's what this man saw when he saw that pearl. And then there always comes the question. You knew this preacher's life was coming, didn't you? Y'all could feel it. You knew. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make those decisions differently? How is your life going to look differently in light of the kingdom of God? And if you think I've got a little three-point thing right after this, where I tell you this is what it has to look like, you're actually wrong, believe it or not. I think you need to wrestle with that. I don't know what your life will look like. You don't know what mine will look like. We know it will look like Jesus, but Jesus in your life 
And God has given you a set of talents, a set of gifts, a set of blessings, and a context and people to serve in your life that are different from the ones that he's given me or the person next to you. And so it is going to look differently. So you need to go home and ask this question. So what does that look like to me? What am I going to do if God's kingdom is worth all that? How do I live differently? Get into the Word. Start looking. There are all kinds of places in Scripture where this question is basically put to us. And then there are teachings about how to apply it. It's too many for us to look at today. And I'm going to give you just one of warning. Mark 8, 36. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Well, what am I going to do with this? If the kingdom of God is worth so much, in light of what Jesus asked, what, would it, what good would it do for me to ignore this and gain a whole lot and yet not know the value of the great pearl, not know the value of the hidden treasure? I'm just going to leave that in your lap, though, because that's what Jesus did too, right? And let you wrestle with that as you need to. N.T. Wright, in his commentary on this, uh, brings this about. I think it's a really good point. The parables in this chapter are a challenge to us at two levels, understanding and action. Understanding without action is sterile. We've seen a lot of that, right? There are a whole lot of churches that know what God wants. They know how he calls us to live. They know about morality. They know all kinds of things. But does anything happen? No. There are a whole lot of Christians individually where they have a great understanding of what the gospel looks like fleshed out because they've seen other people do it, but they ain't got any action going on. Understanding without action is sterile. That's another way, frankly, of just saying dead, right? Sterile means you've killed all the little microbiological life that's in there. No, no living thing left in there. Dead. Understanding without action is sterile. Action without understanding. Why am I doing this? What value is it? I just know we got to do this. That's like coming to church, not because you want to praise the Lord, but because you had to. Well, I guess I'm going to sing. You know, you can tell the difference between a person who's singing because they had to and the person who's singing because they love the Lord. Right? Has nothing to do with tune. Everything to do with heart. Doesn't necessarily have to be loud or anything like that. But you can just see. If it's nothing but a sparkle in the eye, you know there's a difference, isn't there? Action without understanding is exhausting. And it's useless. Because that's like works without faith. Okay, you fed somebody, but you don't believe in them. Works don't save us. So where'd that go? Useless. I think it's a good point. I think it's one we need to chew on. Here's why it matters now. I told you there's three parables. Here's the third one real quick. Look at verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a neck that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh man, did we go there? Well, Jesus did, right? There will be. Is there a day coming when everything's just going to be laid out? That's what Jesus says. When what we have done and what we have said and every careless word will be just put out there in the light and God will judge us righteous or unrighteous, good or evil. Is that day coming? Yes, it is. This is what Jesus says. It's just like a net. And the fisherman doesn't just catch the ones that are rewarded. And everybody else just gets to stay in their comfy little warm sea and it'll be fine. It's not what happens. It says everybody gets drawn in at once and then they start sorting fish. And there are two kinds of fish. There's the fish that's good and there's the fish that's trash. Right? You're going to find some stuff. Nobody's going to eat it. Nobody wants it. Nobody's going to buy it. And that just gets tossed aside to die. One of these is your eternity. Which is it going to be? Of great value, tossed to the side, and no good. And gee, ultimately, we would look at this and say, well, those angels are kind of mean to decide that. No, 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 no. The angels actually aren't deciding. They're just discerning what we decided today. How are we going to live? And what are we going to do with our lives? We 
are the ones who make all those decisions about which pipe we're going to go in because we made all those choices about the way we do or don't live. You see, so that's the way it's going to be. I'm going to put it another way, just real quick. It's like God is, this is a, a, a different parable of sorts. We're all caught in the net. Some are caught to be set free. That's the gospel. We are caught and made servants of Christ to be set free. We get to go and live in this nice, glorious reef, the kingdom of God, where it's beautiful, the sun shines, and there's everything that we ever needed if we know the value of the kingdom of God. If not, tomorrow's lunch. You are one or the other. You get to enjoy life and freedom and blessing. Or, here you go, smoked sardines. Isn't that a beautiful can of sardines, though? Yeah. It's beautiful. But you know what? It's Y'all are like, there's no such thing. No, there really is. These are really good. You should try them. I'll give you a recipe later. Really, really great sardines. But they're dead. Dead in a can. When you don't know the value of the kingdom of heaven, this is what we become. Dead in a can. I'm not joking. Jesus isn't joking. The net comes and the decision gets made. And the eternity one way or the other is real. And it really does 